Joe, my man, how are you? I am great, Tony. Good to see you. I feel like that pain in the ass supplier that keeps reaching out to you like, uh, hey, Joe, can you leave us a review? And hey, Joe, can you uh, can you refer us clients? And hey, Joe, you want you want some more resources? Hey, Joe, <laughs> you want to have a podcast? <laughs> no, it's all great. It's all part of business, man. <laughs> you know, we appreciate you very much, Tony. No, no, no. Oh, that's cool. So how, no how's problem. everything glad, going? Glad to be here with you today. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Very well, thank you. You know, staying busy and um, family's well. We're all well. Um, you know, just um, getting a little bit older every day, but that's okay. <laughs> that's part of life, you know. But uh, overall, um, I can't complain. I'm blessed. That's awesome. I keep forgetting where you are because I I remember you were in Portland for a while, and now you're in. Are you in Colorado? Actually, my son is in Colorado. Uh, I am in a small town called Gig Harbor in Washington, state of Washington. Oh, and wow. um, just a little quaint town, not, very, not a lot of people. It's a maritime town. And we have an office, uh, an R&D an office here in, in uh, Gig Harbor, in addition to our uh, main office in uh, Hillsboro, Oregon. Oh, right, Oregon. Yeah, I remember there was an Oregon uh, connection there. So Gig Harbor, sounds like a harbor town? It is. It is. It's a it's a small harbor town. Uh, a lot of history behind it uh, from the old um, uh, gig boats. Uh, oh, back when they were exploring the area, they used little, uh, not little, but they were gig boats, like a 10 man boat. And uh, they would use that to come into the harbor uh, because the, the entrance is shallow. And then there's a beautiful harbor uh, that's well protected. And that's how it's got his name, Gig Harbor, because he needed a gig to get in here. And um, yeah, it was, it's mainly um, settled by Russians and uh, in, the, in the days of the fishing town, um, lots of um, history behind it. Not much goes on here in the evening, just sort of quiet, but it's a good vacation spot. A lot of people travel here during the summer. It gets very busy with uh, tourism and uh, boaters visiting the area. It's pretty uh, but again, we're in the Pacific Northwest, so we do get a lot of rain uh, up here um, most of the year. So <laughs> we carry an umbrella year round. <laughs> well, actually, people who live in the Northwest don't use an umbrella. But so to speak, you know, we're always prepared for for uh, uh, wet weather. Is that why you moved there, Joe? Is it because you wanted peace and quiet? Like, I know you, you're a retired police officer. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but is that is that what you were looking for? Yes, we were trying to get away from, you know, the hustle and bustle of everyday life and commuting and freeways and just finding a, a more of a uh, off the path, so to speak. Um, nice. So this fits us well and so it's good. We live in a good uh, uh, area and, and um, it's, it's um, yeah, it's quiet. And that was the main thing we were looking for, not, not too busy. And I also enjoy uh, boating and obviously being so close to the water here makes it convenient so i uh, i enjoy that and um yeah it makes it it makes it makes it pleasant is that would, would that have been possible without covid like i know for for us like you know we're scattered all over the country now including myself i moved out of the big city my business partner moved out of the big city um was that basically a result of covid partly i think you know covid um really changed the landscape of business today and and how we operate and i think that is that was one of the the factors yes um like many businesses at one point we had a lot of office space and mm -hmm. everyone came to the office and worked yeah. and collaborated together just you know, the common business the uh interactions that you would have um before covid and uh, COVID, like I said, changed for everybody. Everything moved to online, uh, people working from home. And over the period of time, it, it's almost become the norm uh, mm -hmm. for everybody now. And we see this more and more, even with my own company, uh, we are um, technically global because right now it's no longer just the people within um, around you. It's, it's global. It's a global economy, a global uh, collaborations, uh, global customers. Uh, many companies have um, 
foreign operations and and businesses in the United States. Mm -hmm. So uh, that uh, landscape has really changed and we've adapted well and uh, it has helped our business tremendously. And I think, you know, Tony, something that it's almost like a byproduct of COVID itself that uh, to a certain extent, we are conducting business different because everything has moved to online for us. But at the same time, it, it, it is a benefit to our customers out there because um, it reduces the expense of travel, especially when we're when we're training customers to have to, uh, you know, send a group of trainers to, you know, to the East Coast or wherever they have to go. And, uh, you know, travel is expensive, it's time consuming, uh, exhausting. As you know, if you're going to conduct a, um, a two or three day training, well, you got to put at a day before and after yeah. uh, just to uh, um, be able to make it on right? So, you know, a, a two or three day training turns into a week and, and there's a lot of cost involved in that. Going online uh, has been really a, a blessing for the end for our customers and everyone because we are saving those expenses uh, and have learned to um, perfect the online training and all the different tools and skills that makes uh, learning much better uh, online. So it's, it's worked out. And, and I think overall, geez, for since COVID, people have adapted to um, communicating online and um, the employees like it. I mean, they, they prefer not to commute. They prefer to be at home, especially for, um, our employees who have family and children at home or, mm -hmm. or you know, it, it more family time. So it's been, it's been good overall. I really don't see us going back again and having large office space and, and bringing everybody to the office like we did in the past. I think, uh, you know, it's worked out the way it is right now. And like I said, we have two offices, but um, we reduced the, the space that we're not using anymore, but we still maintain the offices. Yeah, it's a real phenomenon. I remember, um, so we used to have a rule that you couldn't work for us unless you were in Montreal. Um, you spoke English perfectly, right? Because our clients were in the US. And so you're in Montreal, you speak English perfectly, and you had to come to work every single day. And if someone wanted to work remotely for half a day, it was a bit of a scandal. <laughs> but reluctantly, at first, and we were kicking back. We did not like it. We were saying, what do you mean you're shutting down? What do you mean you're forcing us to work remotely? But, you know, it ended up working well. And I remember whenever we would have, like when we had the office, we had pizza day or beer, beer afternoons, like, you know, little activities once a month. Software developers were just like, they all seemed to stay at the computer most of the time. And they didn't even want to be bothered with our little pizza lunches and stuff like that. So. I feel that software development is is conducive to remote work. Um, maybe some other uh, aspects are not. You know, maybe sales, maybe management is not not good for remote. But um, I never thought of it on, from your perspective of actually training your clients. Though that's something I didn't even think about, and that's absolutely true. So a client can do the training of armor link and we'll, we'll start talking about armor link now they'll do the training of armor link from the comfort of wherever they are which is great for them and it also saves a lot of uh you know travel and hassle on your end is that is that effective though are they so are you doing that on uh on zoom uh teams how's that working yes 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 exactly um it often it depends on the uh, security requirements of the client and some prefer to use, you know, one application versus another. So <laughs> along with learning to teach online and work online, uh, we've also adapted to the technologies of learning the various systems. You know, we can have one meeting on Google Meet, the other one's going to be on Zoom, the other one's going to be on Teams, you know, and all the different. Uh, apps out there that exist for online collaboration and uh, we become versed at it. And, you know, I mean, they all, for the most part, um, have similar functionalities. Some yeah, are better at it than others. But 
But at the end of the day, it's the same thing. It's two people communicating. You know, back in the days, you know, uh, you know, uh, I'm in, approaching quickly my mid sixties, but you know, I remember uh, television. We had Hollywood Squares. If you go back to that time, yeah, uh, where uh, you know you had all the uh, stars and on camera, and it reminds me of Hollywood Squares, you know, right. where you have uh, people <laughs> in a meeting. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but. Um, the yes, the, the the training aspect of it is 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 one benefit. Also, um, it's very easy to you know demonstrate things to people. We can share screens. We can mm -hmm. um, use tools to guide people uh, to use the application. Uh, we can um, take polls and and you know huddles. And there's just a lot of different collaboration tools um, that really uh, um, gets the job done uh, you know there's still a place for a face-to-face -face meeting i think and i and i think there's there's still are circumstances where um maybe seeing the client face-to-face -face, um has a more profound impact maybe on influencing a deal or people get to know you that that human factor really never goes away uh, i think that it is just not as necessary today as it was in the past, but it's always nice when you can meet someone face to face and have a cup of coffee and you know, oh, yeah. uh, discuss things and, and and that human interaction is priceless, right? Because you really get to know a person, and you know, especially when you're dealing with um, uh, foreign countries and and if you're doing a, a global business which is hard not to do today, right? With so many businesses operating uh, globally. Well, in your case, I mean, you are based out of Canada and they have operations in the US and you know, banking and, and resources that are, are international, so to speak. And having uh, the, the understanding of different cultures and around the world that some uh, cultures are more comfortable face to face and they prefer to get to know you and they have certain uh, preferences. And sometimes that's hard to overcome online because you don't have that human interaction. And so we can see that. So I think that there are, there's still a, a place for, for, for that. And we see that in business also when you have companies that um, have a hybrid work where maybe people come into the office or meet maybe you know once or twice a week and then the rest it's uh, and the rest is at home so it's kind of a combination so it's not all one extreme and that um, is a good um, compromise uh, between full-time home and and um, and not being at the office and at the same time for developers and and uh, trainers in our case uh, we have employees who are trainers, uh, employees who are developers, uh, you know, DevOps and all that. Uh, each skill set uh, may do well or not so well sometimes uh, working remotely because it really comes down to personality style. Some people just prefer the, the human interaction. You know, I just experienced that. I um, was hiring a, a, a trainer who was highly qualified. Um, fantastic credentials. Uh, but once they realized that they had been working for so many years uh, in a classroom environment, being around people, and all of a sudden they're going to be working from home and that human interaction is just gone. I mean, you go from daily interaction to zero interaction. It was quite the shocker. And, you know, frankly, the person just said, I, I, I didn't realize that I just couldn't do this because I am such a people person that I have been around classrooms my entire life. I just can't sit at home between four walls and, you know, look at people on a computer. It's just, um, you know, and, uh, and, and I can understand that if you grew up that way and you've done that your whole life and some people just don't adapt to it. But mm -hmm. for the most part today, I think people are accustomed to doing what we're doing right now. In this case, you and I sharing a podcast and talking to each other, uh, you know, we, we have the communication and, and uh, just seeing you is fantastic. And, you know, it's just the way we do business today. Yeah, I totally agree. And it seems to be, and by the way, we tried the hybrid approach, um, but we made it optional. 
because with software developers, you know, especially a couple of years ago, you got to be a little bit careful. It's a very competitive market. You want to keep your good people, make them happy. Uh, so we made it optional and we had a 5,000 square foot space and there was three people coming in twice uh, a week. And we never, I never even knew when they were going to show up. They decided internally and they just showed up and <laughs> it was really, it didn't work. But um, yeah, and a lot of times too, going in person to a meeting, because everyone's kind of away from the big cities now. A lot of people are. Let's say you're an hour outside Boston. And your boss says, hey, you got to go into Boston, uh, you know, downtown and uh, have a meeting with Joe's people so you can get trained. They're like, well, can't we do this on Zoom? You know, like uh, it's my day to watch the kids <laughs> that day, you know, but, uh, but <laughs> you, know, so you got to kind of roll the punches today. Right. If if you've got a great employee, and you keep them happy, you just say, hey, you want to go, you want to go on Zoom. It's it's optional. Right. Um, I'm very, I'm very curious, to Joe. Let's talk about Armor Link. Um, I, I'll try and stumble across uh, describing Armor Link. Armor Link is a way for law enforcement agencies um, to track their uh, assets. An asset being a, a weapon, a holster, a helmet. So, it, I would love it if you can explain. What is Armor Link and what does Armor Link uh, do? Sure. Absolutely. So, if I were to give you a one liner, what we are, we are, by core, we are a firearm management company. We help um, law enforcement agencies manage their firearms and everything that goes with a firearm. So, let me put it in context what that means. In law enforcement, when an agency issues a firearm, to an officer, they assume three responsibilities. They uh, immediately, number one, they have an obligation to track that firearm. Uh, some are uh, dependent on federal law. There are certain weapons that require uh, strict control uh, by law enforcement uh, regulations like uh, uh, full autom automatic uh, weapons, uh, short barrel uh, shotguns and rifles, uh, certain explosives, you know, there's just a, a, a criteria of certain firearms that fall within um, requirements of tracking. Uh, and those uh, enforcements and regulations are from the Department of Justice and, and here in the United States. So even if the agency issues you a firearm, it's the onus is upon the agency to know where that firearm is at all times. Yes, yes. And they're subject to audit by the uh, Department of Justice or anybody who's going to be a county, whether it be an accreditation agency or, or um, um, a, a governmental agency, uh, especially if the agency has acquired firearms on loan from the government. And we have programs like that in the United States where the, the government gives uh, firearms to the uh, agency on on a loaner basis and then within that program uh, the agency is subject to audit and has to maintain uh, accountability for those firearms at all times so they're held responsible for that and usually it's because they have received um, maybe surplus or extra military weapons uh, uh, equipment that is given to the agency on loan it's not given permanent so it's a loan program that they uh, use these these weapons. So that is one of the uh, requirements that they have to track these firearms. The second responsibility is that they have an obligation to train the officer on the utilization of these uh, firearms and equipment. So uh, there are state regulations on the training requirements and how many hours of training an officer receives uh, and in various subject matters. Uh, whether it be firearms or um, law or first aid, CPR, you know, you arrange all the different qualifications. Um, some states regulate that and have specific requirements uh, that the agencies have to comply with. And the third uh, thing that agencies have to do is uh, maintain that firearm according to the um, uh, firearm manufacturer specification. And 
most agencies will send their officers to what we call armor schools that are generally uh, put on by the uh, gun manufacturer. Uh, and when these officers become certified as an armor for a particular firearm platform, they then are um, have the credentials to service and maintain these firearms. They're not, they're not gunsmiths. Uh, there's a difference between an armor and a gunsmith. A gunsmith will build you a firearm and the armor is more of a maintenance, uh, repair, uh, firearms operational. Okay. So those three things are the core of, um, what agencies, um, their responsibilities and armor link handles, uh, those things as a primary function of the application. How do we manage those things? You see, because the officers who are trained at the factory uh, for the particular farm, you know, let's say you bought a farm brand X, Y, Z, and I attend that school for, for that farm brand. And uh, when I come back, I'm certified, but there's a gap. And that gap is how do we organize the agency effectively and efficiently to do these tasks, to repair firearms? to maintain them. And you have many things that come to place, uh, scheduling, uh, parts inventory, uh, maintenance records, uh, tracking records, and, you know, and a whole bunch of other information that needs to all be in, in sync uh, to be effective. And that's where our solution comes in, that we, we actually bring all those things together in one application. In addition to that, like the saying goes that one item breeds other items if the agency issues the firearm to the officer but then there's where are you going to put the gun so i have to then issue you the holster but if i give you the holster i have to give you the belt <laughs> and if i give you the belt i have to give you the pouches for the magazines and the chest and you know and the uniform that i had and pretty soon there is just a whole inventory of items that i have to issue this officer so then we also track the equipment that the off the agency needs to issue to the officer with the training, with the inventories and the ammunition. And you can see just one thing triggers the other and the other and the other. And pretty soon what happens in our profession in law enforcement, and I say our profession, cause you know, I served in law enforcement for almost 18 years. I retire now from, from law enforcement, but uh, the, the requirement to track all these things and maintain all this, for some agencies, they end up with four or five different applications that they're trying to make them all talk together. So the value that we bring with our and what we're doing is we're giving customers a single platform that allows these various tasks all to work in sync. So you don't have to buy five programs to try to coordinate the day-to-day -day operations of issuing guns, returning guns, training people, scheduling, going to the range, issuing equipment, returning equipment. You know, and of course I can talk to you for hours and hours, but I don't want to uh, be repetitious, but that is the big picture. I, I was, you know, that we are giving a single solution um, for the agency to use. I think that's also valuable because if you have four different applications, like in your example, you may have to have two, three, four different employees Okay, Johnny knows this, uh, you know, Joan knows that. So with one single application like ArmorLink, obviously that adds tremendous value. It's specialized. Quick question. So you you were a police officer for 18 years. You retired a detective, correct? I did, yes. Did you envision the creation of ArmorLink while you were a, a police detective? Or did it come... Like, how, what's the story behind that? Like, how did Armor Link get started? Well, it started uh, when I went to armor school and, and I realized that uh, there was a gap between uh, what I learned at armor school and getting the job done. It's two different things. You know, you, 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 you return to your agency certified, you know, I'm ready to go. I'm an armor, I'm a certain, so to speak. I have my credentials. I know how to work on a gun. I know how to fix a, you know, the firearm and, and everything that we need to make that firearm safe and operational, but how do I coordinate all these things? And that's when I said, is there a program for this? Is there software? And 
come to find out there was really not a mission specific software. There were some things out there that existed, but not quite what, what we were looking for. So that's when I said, wait a minute, I, uh, I think I can build something. I can have something made that um, will fill this gap. And that's where really everything started. The original, um, and that was really the a link, you know, where I was trying to fix that missing link of, of uh, between going to school and getting the job done in the agency. And there was a big gap there. The um, original thought and um, also when I started the company was um, to further extend this link to the firearm manufacturer. Uh, I originally, um, when we started the company, this was back in 2013, uh, almost 11 years ago. Um, I approached some of these gun manufacturers and proposed the idea that why not link uh, our application to their factory and then the factory can interface with the customer through our application and receive real time data of what is going on in their factories uh, and in, in the actual, not, I'm sorry, not the factory, the, the um, agency. If I see that the armor is going through a lot of parts or they need to fulfill their inventory uh, with additional parts to provide real time information to the gun manufacturer to have better forecasting of what they need to build and stock and inventory, or if there's they're noticing a defect or why a part's being replaced more frequently than frequently than another part that maybe um, shouldn't be replaced so often. So I wanted to provide that information to the gun manufacturers, but for one reason or another, it, it, it really never took off. Um, there, there wasn't a lot of interest in that. Most manufacturers were interested in selling guns and keeping status quo. So we didn't pursue that uh, opportunity and we pivoted and then went directly to the uh, agencies where uh, they were more receptive because they understood that this would be beneficial to them. Uh, so I really had um, to do that pivot early up front and after I recognized that the gun manufacturer market wasn't really uh, something that was receptive at that time. You know, maybe now today I haven't pursued that again, but, you know, 11 years later, sure. that maybe in the future can change. Who knows? Uh, I, I'm not going to close the door on that, but um, it is something that could still be viable. Who knows? Uh, things change. But uh, the going directly to the agencies was a, a good call for us because that's how we built our company. We built our company going directly to the uh, agencies and showing them what we do. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. As they say, we, we built literally the company one customer at a time. Is it easy for an agency to, to ramp up with armor link? Like well, without getting into any, any trade secrets, I don't want to, you know, I mean, is it easy for, um, a police agency of, of let's say hundreds of hundreds of officers, is it easy for them to integrate into armor link? Absolutely. Um, the, our approach is that when we built the application, we have um, mapped spreadsheets for everything that we track. A, an agency can provide all their information on Excel spreadsheets or Google Sheets, whatever they have, and um, basically just yeah, put everything on there uh, on the um, uh, on the spreadsheets and we we're able to upload very quickly and bring that information into our system and populate it with the, um, users, their firearm serial numbers their equipment, their inventories, their, uh, qualifications, training records. So it's very easy to do that. Uh, as long as the, you know, they provide the information on the mapped mapped spreadsheets that we have, that's been mapped to our application. We also, offer the ability to connect with um, APIs uh, with uh, legacy programs. And that's another option. So we have made it really uh, easy to start with us. And in, in addition to that, uh, the people that we hire are professional trainers, which is really uh, something that a lot of companies that sell software don't do. Their they their support people or their trainers may not, not necessarily be 
professional trainers. They may be the people who know the software <laughs> or they may be the engineers, but horrible teachers, <laughs> horrible teachers. They're fantastic developers and they can just do miracles with the keyboard. But when it comes to, um, parting information to other people, um, you know, you have, uh, it requires a different uh, skill set. So we made it a point, um, to hire our trainers, um, who are professional educators or trainers who have been, uh, who have the degrees. Our, our training manager has a master's degree in education and training. Uh, you know, every, every other trainer we have has similar, uh, requirements because we, ha we, are focusing on just having people who enjoy training and they have the people skills, they have the patience and they have the know-how to train people at all different levels, because not everyone that comes to us in our audience, you know, is not um, a younger person who um, was fortunate. I always say fortunate to, to, to grow up in these times, so to speak, and in technology. And, and, uh, you know, some people say, Oh, you know, nowadays is really bad and kids are exposed to so much. Well, yes, there's some certain truths to that, but I say for the younger generations and uh, who I say fortunate because um, if you really start to think about it, how much uh, learning and how smart young people are today, how much they acquire information. I mean, gosh, when I grew up as a kid, we, I, I had to go to the library and go through the card catalog and uh, three by five cards in the library to find a book. And the Britannica library was just like the bomb. I mean, that was it. You know, if you had a Britannica, you knew a lot of stuff, right? So the encyclopedia and going to the library was the way you, you went, you know, back in the 70s. But uh, yeah, don't forget, Joe, when you went to the library, it was in a snowstorm. <laughs> that's right that's right you went in a snowstorm and you went there and it was a quiet room and also information wasn't readily available and um a lot of the information we learned back then you know was either um through tribal knowledge passed downs your neighbors um you know your parents um, taught you things and that's how you learned or you had to go to the library and look it up and guess what when we had to call people the phone number was up here yeah <laughs> I don't even know my wife's phone number. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it was a whole different world. But the point I'm trying to stress, obviously, is that um, nowadays, uh, because of the wealth of information and how quickly um, information can be verified, uh, we can learn, uh, we can collaborate, share, and really um, just expand, uh, has had a huge impact in, in, in every profession or every industry. And uh, that's a that's a big plus. Uh, so we're we're capitalizing on that. We try to every day and and continuously improve because we, you really can't sleep in your laurels. You you have to stay competitive. You have to uh, be innovative, um, and you have to um, be ha have the vision to see what's coming down the pipeline and what the future is is, is bringing and, and what companies need to do to survive and, and exist because once you get comfortable um you know there's going to be someone else who wants to eat your lunch basically <laughs> yeah we've all been there for sure well it's great your training programs uh, you know your trainers sound awesome it sounds like it sounds like you hired teachers taught them the software and then they're teaching the software as opposed to you know getting engineers you know course engineers are awesome but like you said they may not be good teachers i don't know they, they do i mean the engineers the engineers they do interact with our customers i mean i have situations maybe uh, maybe we're doing a single sign-on um, interface or something and whatever the case may be and it may require the engineer to come to the table and, and be very technical and they excel at that boy when they start talking technical i'm lost it's like oops you know i i yeah <laughs> Oh, I am sure, <laughs> you know, but uh, I am not quite sure what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, as long as they know what they're talking about. Okay, but that brings me to my next question for you. Now, you're a retired police detective with, uh, you know, a, a plus or minus 18 years of service. You come up with this idea based on, you know, what you're seeing is missing out there. Now, how do you get this software built? 
because you know because I know you have known you for I don't know how many years five or six years I know you're not a software developer like myself we're not we're more you know you have your 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 skill sets and uh, we've got you know the soft skills and all that stuff but how does a non engineer a non software developer a non CTO go about building what has become ArmorLink and is such a, you know, such a leader in the industry and has so many agencies using your software. How do you, how do you go from zero to hero? <laughs> well, it was a long road and uh, a very tough and expensive path. <laughs> oh, is that right? Uh, and, but <laughs> I could talk about that for sure, but Listen, I, the starting was interesting. Um, I, I had, um, my, I previously, before I was in law enforcement, I worked in the apparel industry and I was exposed to technology and CAD, uh, technology, uh, computer aided design and, and, um, plotters and servo cutters and just a wide range of technologies. So, um, technology wasn't new to me, uh, but, but at the same time, I, I've, I'm not a developer. Uh, and creating software is a whole different game. As I learned, <laughs> um, I, you know, I didn't really have a mentor, so to speak, at the beginning. I just, um, I just went for, it. I just did it, you know. And it's, um, I would not recommend somebody doing <laughs> what I did. You know, it's always good to find someone in the business. I wish I would have known you when I when I early already started, Tony. It would have been my life much easier. Uh, you know, at the very very beginning of the inception of the company. But um, the um, the beginning was uh, I, I actually drew all the screens uh, on PowerPoint and uh, designed the software on a presentation on a slide presentation. So I, I made a whole bunch of slides, and when every time I you know uh, I click next, it was like the software screens working. So it's almost it looked like a software, but it was only slides. Okay, on a on a PowerPoint presentation. And, uh, and then, um, well, that's pretty common. Yeah. It was my, my version of, you know, Figma or all the different softwares that you do for UI UX. <laughs> I just did it on PowerPoint. So I used paint, Microsoft paint and <laughs> PowerPoint to build the uh, initial uh, concept of how the AI was going to work. Um, I was fortunate my wife, um, uh, being in business and, and, she was uh, worked at very top companies and executives, and she has a lot of experience in in um, process optimization. She's you know Lean Six Sigma certified and has a lot of knowledge. Worked in the top companies, top names you can imagine. Um, her career was fantastic, and she brought a lot of experience in process optimization and process and flow. Um, and then I did um, eventually hire. Um, an initial group of engineers and people who could help me bring the product to fruition to actually start uh, developing. So I had to obviously bring in the right people, the team. I did put a team together, but the initial design and concept of what I wanted to do, I just did it. And, and I didn't look how other softwares were built. I didn't want to be influenced what was in the market. I really created um, a, a user interface um, and a methodology that was not um, common. And the reason I did that um, is because our market back then, 11 years ago, and even today, um, we, we had a, a really diverse end user. And I think that for any business, you got to understand who your end user is. If you don't understand who your customer is, you really can't cater to them. You don't understand their needs. And in my profession in law enforcement, we have, um, we, at that time, I'm talking 11 years ago, uh, there were still a lot of people who um, were not keen to computers, didn't like using computers. Uh, you know, uh, it was just um, not an environment that made it easy. So. So basically we had to start with a solution that could work for a wide range of end users with different skill sets. Um, you know, uh, cloud technology was not taken off 11 years ago. 
Uh, I remember the challenges that a lot of people were not, I shouldn't say a lot. Um, there were agencies that were hesitant to use cloud technology because of fears of um, breaches. And we come from a traditional on-prem solution, you know how that goes. So cloud was just uh, beginning. We were ahead of the curve because we were already developing a cloud solution when everybody else was still on-prem and you know, giving you the CD. And I remember when I started 11 year girls, people say, well, send me a CD with a demo. Send me, <laughs> send me the demo on a CD. So we don't, I mean, where did CDs go? I don't see them. I just give down as, you know, decorations, but um, the, uh, so it was different, uh, but I did design it on PowerPoint and put a team together to start um, developing the application. And we started with the firearm side. We started with the firearm tracking, the um, maintenance, the parts, the qualifications. And that was the beginning of the application. Of course, over the years, we expanded that tremendously to different things based on uh, well, user feedback and our customers telling us what they want, uh, what they need. And um, But the path to that was challenging, Tony, as you know. Um, you, we could talk about how. Did you, Joe, did you? So, so, so obviously, as an owner of a, a software development company, I have interest in you know the following did you hire a company to build your software or did you assemble individual talents to make it happen no i hired a company uh, a software development company that had um all the engineers and all, everybody in-house that was uh, the first uh, comp well not the first company i had interviewed a number of companies one of the challenges back then was that if the project wasn't to a certain level of, of dollar value, um, they wouldn't take your project. So some of these software development companies said, unless you're going to spend, you know, a million dollars with us, we're not even going to talk to you. So it was, it was a challenge just to, to find a company that would even take our project to begin with on a small startup, you know, uh, uh, with, with a small budget and, um, so essentially, uh, we uh, finally found a local company uh, that um, specialized in software development and robotics, um, had a, a pretty large team of resources that agreed to take our, our project on. So we started with this company and um, for, for many years, they, we worked with them uh, developing uh, at that time. Everything was outsourced through contractors because um, obviously the company was just established, and we didn't have the the um, the revenue and and the uh, clientele yet, and the infrastructure to warrant uh, going in house and building our internal infrastructure. And like all businesses, um, you know, the owner does everything right at the beginning. Uh, you're you're everything, uh, little by little, and as you grow, you start employing people but um the old saying you started from your garage so to speak well i didn't start from the garage but um started from home okay but not the garage <laughs> i don't have to it's computers right did you have at least one client i did i did and i, I well um actually um after after i first made the first version um 1.0 and i went to solicit to many agencies uh, we were turned down we were turned down because we were new. Um, you know, most people were looking for a company that in business for five years. Uh, we weren't established. When you say agency, you mean the client, right? Like a law enforcement agency. Yes, an agency. I'm referring to a law enforcement agency. So obviously, you're we're we're a new business. Uh, we don't have we haven't been in business five years. Um, we're starting with a new product. So there's a lot of, um, uh, I don't want to say red flags, but things that agencies would be hesitant because you're not proven, you haven't, you don't have a record and they're going to, in their mind, which I can understand. I, I mean, I, I'm not saying they're wrong. They're thinking it's, it, it's tough. It's tough, you know, to someone to, to essentially gamble on someone who's new and say, well, is this vendor going to work out? Is, you know, is Joe legitimate? Is this company? 
And so my approach was with the very first customer that I had is um, my approach coming from law enforcement and being in law enforcement is um, we have we have a, a, a saying in law enforcement, uh, you lie, you die. That means that your integrity and, and your word is everything in law enforcement. Yeah, you told me you told me that on day one when we first met each other. You said, Tony, I like you, but you lie, you die. <laughs> That's it. That's it. I like you, Tony, but if you lie, you die. That means that we have zero. And, and I say that you can interview any employee in my company, any employee. And when I meet with them, the first thing I say to them, I'm very simple. You can make all the mistakes you want. Don't worry about it. We will fix the mistakes. I will give you the resources. I won't reprimand you. You know, anything like that. Mistakes happen. But if you lie to me, pack up and leave because you lie, you die. I, we don't, we just can't do that. If we lose, if we lose the trust of our customers and our integrity, I don't have a business. I don't have a business because number one, um, no law enforcement agency is going to trust you. And number two, you're not credible. And uh, who wants to, you know, to be in, in, in partnership with someone who's not credible. So what I did in my very first customer, I, I, I remember this vividly in, in my first presentation ever that I did to a customer. Um, they liked what they saw. They liked what I was doing. And they asked me, how many customers do you have? And I said, and I just looked at him and I says, I have none. And I hope you're my first. And I said it reassured. With no hesitation, I said, I have no customers. I hope you're going to be my first customer. And the room went quiet. The room, the room went quiet. I remember um, there was a lieutenant, a sergeant. There was a group of people in the room. And here I am saying, I have no customers, and I hope you're my first. And 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 the room just, I, I kid you not, it went quiet. Everybody says, like, I didn't know this guy didn't have any customers. I didn't know what is this, you know? And then they all looked at each other and goes, fine. And uh, I think that, I, I think that just, the, I don't think they were expecting that from a vendor. And uh, they said, fine. And I actually signed them up and um, I started with one just like that. And that was my first customer. And uh, from that point forward, um, it was like that. And, and, uh, the first five years was a struggle. It was a very tough first five years because like software, um, it, it's a struggle to start. It's, it's capital intensive. Um, you have to spend a lot of money to develop, uh, engineering is expensive and, and it is today. It was in the past and it will always be because you're hiring some, uh, you know, very specialized people. Um, it takes, um, our, our sales cycles are long. It's not unusual for an agency to put in for a budget and you may not talk to them for a year or two. And then uh, two years later, they call you, Hey, Joe, I talked to you two and a half years ago. We're ready to buy. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, and you look at my seat, you know, and I look at it, I'm still around. And I go, yeah, I'm still around. And I look and I go, Oh yeah, I talked to you back in 2018. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, but that's just the way the profession is, you know, budgets take a long time. Uh, uh, getting approvals, you know, agencies have to go through a lot through um, committees and, and budget approvals and, you know, funding. So there's many, many stars need to align in our profession to make it happen. And we understand that. But the point I'm trying to make here in, in starting a business such as ours, um, you know, I, I, there were some things I never anticipated, Tony, I didn't anticipate the, the, the lag um, between a presentation and an actual closing of a deal. I didn't really think that software development would be so involved and how crucial it is to work with good people. I mean, the, the, uh, a software development company can break or make a company. I really can. I mean, I, I sincerely believe it. if you have, um, you know, if you have good management, you've got um, good project leaders, you've got good developers, you have a good team. Uh, it's wonders for for the client. It, it's 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 a huge peace of mind. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't have that, um, it, it can be very costly. And and I've experienced that. You know, I'm sure maybe we talk about that today, but not with you, of course. But um, uh, with, with prior um, contracts, uh, that um, it was um, quite quite the eye opener and, and quite interesting how we. Um, 
you know, uh, navigated those those years. Uh, but it was it was a big learning curve for for me. Absolutely, Joe, and it's um, it's so important. And a lot of people don't realize they have a good idea. They're going to build the software. They get some funding, and then if they don't pick the right company to hire to build this software, it, it's over. Like, okay, well, I had this idea. It probably would have worked, but I never got it off the ground because I hired the right the, the wrong company. And it's it's insane how often that happens. Um, but back to your uh, your first client, that must have given you a massive boost of confidence to go in there and and say well, then when they ask how many clients do you do you have and you say, well, I hope you're going to be my first and you've got the deal. That must have like I'm sure you remember that day vividly. Like I remember my first sale for my company, like where I was, who the client was, what I said. That must that must have been a real special moment and for the whole family, too. It was for family, for all of us. Um, you know, we um, we literally bet the farm uh, on the business, so to speak. As just, as the going says, uh, you know, we we we're, we were we've always been self funded. We we have no investors. We're not owned by a, by a, a, a acquisition group or um, venture capitalist or anything like that. This is still a uh, privately held corporation. Um, my wife and I are the, um, the president, vice president of the corporation, and we, it's, it's, it's privately, privately held. And uh, we've done it with our own money and our own uh, hard work. Um, I worked uh, and still do, you know, work much, much harder today than I did when I was in law enforcement. You know? <laughs> so uh, because, you know, when you're a business owner, you got a lot to do. And building a business is tough. It's not easy to build a business. You have to, you have to, you know, be able to to work hard and then work hard and then work hard. And when you're done working hard, you work hard again. So it's, it's the point I'm stressing here is uh, that uh, it's 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 you have to be resilient. Uh, entrepreneurship and business is not for everybody. Uh, you know, the satisfaction obviously comes from uh, being able to do some good for other people, uh, for a profession, uh, that, you know, I loved, um, being a police officer detective. Uh, if I had to do it all over again, I would do it again the same way. Um, times have changed. Law enforcement is much different today than it was, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. But, um, the profession itself in law enforcement, you don't do it for the money. You don't do it uh, for any other reason than the willingness that you want to serve, um, do something good for people. And the the experiences that I had in law enforcement and, and helping people, especially when I was a detective and solving some very heinous crimes and, and things that affected people for the rest of their lives, the satisfaction to solve those crimes, bring justice to people, help um people who were helpless, especially children. I worked on um, cases, homicide and, and um, uh, child abuse cases. Um, the reward in that is huge, that you can do something good for someone else. Um, so I really enjoyed law enforcement. I have a great love for the career that I, that I served. And now, you know, I did retire from law enforcement had been a CEO of a company that deals with law enforcement, I really haven't left the profession because every day I still, um, you know, talk shop with my customers and their law enforcement. And I keep in touch with, you know, people that I've worked with for years. So I really haven't left the profession, so to speak, but um, it is honorable. Um, it is um, a great uh, profession if you are in it for the right reason, uh, not, but definitely we don't do it for the money. <laughs> it's not a, a thing that we do for that. So, um, yes, it was a challenge, you know, at the beginning. You know, obviously we, we worked together for, for several years and I can tell you're a genuine good guy that, you know, you're, you're, you're like me. You don't want to go to work every day and have horrible messages of clients from clients that aren't happy. You know, you, you want them to be happy. You, you make sure that you put the time and effort and money into building your software properly so that, you know, your clients have a good experience. Hey, I'm, I'm glad you bet the farm and it, and it came out great uh, because obviously, you know, you, you practice perseverance, right? You didn't give up. Can you 
Now, here's where I'm going to ask you a question about, you know, uh, an experience you went through and you can, you can give us all as much info as possible. I kind of, not that I'm interested in nightmares, um, but I, I find that, you know, people like us who, um, well, when I say people like us, I mean, our technical knowledge level start hiring, um, software development companies often get into trouble. And I have, uh, like during these podcasts, I always like to ask my guests, have you ever had a software development uh, nightmare? Have you ever hired the wrong company? And I know that you have, but again, you, if you share as little or as much as you want. Uh, so the question is, have you ever gotten yourself into a nightmare when it comes to software development companies? I have, I have. And uh, like any business, um, we all go through experiences, right? Um, not everything is a cakewalk. Um, no matter what profession or what industry, what kind of business you're in, um, it has at times uh, bumps in the road. Uh, or as I say, Murphy shows up and you have the unexpected happen. It's unfortunate, but it's right. happened. Murphy shows up. <laughs> Murphy shows up. <laughs> yeah, unexpectedly. Sure, and no, absolutely. You know, and um, when no, and I'm, I I can share that with you. Um, uh, the the initial the onset, you know, everything was going. Uh, w one would say okay when you're not being successful, meaning that you know, the company is not roaring, and you know we got customers coming in through the door like tomorrow. It's a startup. It, you you have your your first years of business are tough. They're always tough. You know, what are they he's saying that if you make it past five years, you're doing good. If you can get past the five year mark, most uh, in the software, I think people fail much earlier in that because it, it, it's a tough business. As I said, um, it requires a lot of capital to sustain it. Um, so everything was going OK initially with the, 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 the company I initially contracted with. And uh, when uh, now you have to understand that we're um, turning over um, all of our intellectual property and disclosing all of the trade secrets because somebody has to build it. Right. I have to tell you what we're going to do. 100 percent. Your business model, your everything. Yeah. yeah. I'm giving you my methodologies, you know, what we call intellectual property, um, my methodology, what makes yeah. a success, why we're building things. You have to trust somebody, you have to tell somebody, and you have to tell a group of people or companies who are making the product for you. Now, of course, there are legal protections that you can do with this. Of course, you have non-disclosure agreements, you have contractual agreements, mm -hmm. non-compete, uh, uh, even, you know, even with all the um, proper legal documentation, you can still, it's still not going to prevent um, uh, a problem if it's going to happen. I mean, you can you can say you can be as cautious as you want. It's like saying you can put on your computer um, uh, antivirus, but there's no guarantee that your computer might get hacked or it might get infected, right? Even if you've done everything you can. So, you know, you can you can try. Yeah, exactly. And and if some individual or some director of a company uh, decides to do something bad, despite an agreement, you know, they'll, they'll do it, right? All you, the, all you have is you have recourse, you bring them to court and, uh, you know, who wants to do that? So you gotta, you have to assume you're dealing with someone with uh, good intentions when they sign an NDA or they sign any type of agreement, but, uh, exactly. So there, there has to be some trust at a certain point. I mean, you just can't, you just can't do it without relying on, um, on, on a group of people or that you're trusting to who are, are going to work candidly and honestly with you. So when the company started to grow and um, the, and you can see the success that we're having, we're seeing that things are growing. You see it as a viable company go, God, you know, these people started slow, but I can see now that they're building the, the application. And, you know, the first years of the company, obviously, we're learning a lot, right? We're learning what the customers want, uh, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. So you're constantly pivoting and adjusting and, and, and you're, you're, you're molding the product uh, to, the, to the market requirements. So the first years were, were critical yeah. to listen 
to your customer, right? What they want. But I am getting this this information uh, because I have the inroad to the to the to the market, right? I'm getting real time feedback from people that I am face to face with. And this is prior to COVID. So I did a lot of face to face and a lot of travel in my early years. Uh, very little was being done over the internet. It was it was mainly in person. And, uh, you know, this is a lot of travel and, you know, sport codes and time or whatever. And you're there in front of the audience. And so we're, so I was collecting quite a bit of information, uh, valuable information, uh, strategic information that was molding our product. And I'm divulging this to the team that's making all this information. Along the way of this, we also um, uh, created um, uh, a registered trademark for our product. Uh, for our, our logo, our, our brand is a federal registered trademark. So we were doing things that, you know, that were making us uh, a viable company, a growing company and, and successful. So and you were also making yourself unique. Yes, we were making ourselves unique. That is correct. Um, so the company that we initially started with, um, we had shared some a lot of information. They started. Uh, unbeknownst to us and not quite aware what was going on, um, they infringed on our intellectual property and um, um, they started building applications and using our intellectual property to basically make a competing business. That's what happened. So when I get wind of that, that this is what's going on, um, you know, hey, you're, you're you're ripping me off. You're taking all my information, and now you want to build a competing business, and you want to take my IP address, and I mean not IP address, intellectual property, I should say. Um, we had to, we had, you know, we had an emergency. We had to um, bail out of the other quickly and shut everything down uh, with this vendor, which you know, uh, as I stressed before, that how critical it is to work with a reputable company and, and how important it is to work with a software company that is, that, that, you know, is dialed in that, that they're honest, they're sincere, you know, they're le legitimate, you know, they're in there for the right reason, not to steal um, other people's uh, ideas and intellectual property. So prior to me engaging this company, I had done, um, market research and and actually i knew of uh, your company tony uh simply php uh back then i actually had researched i actually reached out to you guys and because i wanted to have other companies uh possible to work with me one of the reasons we didn't go with simply php at that time uh when we started was because the original company that we worked with was, was local it was in our town it was very convenient for me. I was still working in law enforcement uh, early on. Um, my agency knew about it, uh, where I worked. Uh, I had a, a letter and approval from, from the chief that uh, I told them what I was doing. I explained to them. Uh, so I was uh, I was doing this, you know, in the up and up. It wasn't like I was moonlighting and then neglecting my, my job as, as a law enforcement officer. In fact, um, just to be clear on this, uh, when I when I started the company and let my agency know about this, I told them when I get to the point where my business is growing and I can't do both, I can't be a cop and I can't be uh, a CEO, I will uh, retire. And because I'm not going to put myself in, in that situation where I'm compromising uh, my duty as a law enforcement officer to pursue a business. And, and, uh, you know, my agency trusted me on, on that and the chief approved it and, and I was good to go. So, um, at that time, uh, when we discovered this and I said, I have sourced your company, that was the reason why it was local. Um, and for me, it was convenient at that time, but I knew of your company and you were one of the companies that I had, um, sourced and, and, and thought what could do a good job for us. Uh, if not, well, I found out you did a better job for us, but, but nevertheless, right. It's what they say. It's water under the bridge. And that's what it was at the inception. And I understand, I understand Joe in, in your situation. And, and if you can go with someone local that you can actually go visit them in their office and the price is, is competitive makes total sense. I would have, I would have done the same thing. I wouldn't have expected a company to do what they did. Is it from what from what I understand, they basically uh, copied your 
business model. They, 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 they took your inter intellectual property and they started competing with you. Like, yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. Correct. So how did you find out? So uh, it doesn't matter how you found out, but when you, when you found out, you, you decided, okay, I have to bail on, I have to bail on this company and obviously take legal action, but who's going to run my software while I'm doing this type of thing, right? That was, that was the, the situation that I found myself overnight. So thankfully I had, um, uh, known you and uh well i shouldn't known I, I i knew of you we had met i had talked to your company you had done a presentation to us early on i don't know if you remember that but i remember that was before covid and i remember a big conference room and lots of people sitting around the table uh, in that meeting and and you know you introduce your company and so i already had um um, screened your company as like okay this will be a great company to work with at some point well, who would have known that that um, would be calling you, you know, that soon, right? Into into our product. So when we get wind of what's going on, we discover what's going on. Um, we uh, immediately, um, I the first thing I did was pick up the phone and call you, and I said, uh, Tony, I got a problem. Um, I need to move uh, my development team over to you. I, I need you to take over for me. I think in our profession, they call that to rescue a code or code rescue. Um, uh, and um, I say, can you can you help me out? Uh, I'm in a bind right now. I, I the people that I have working for me have done something, you know, very unethical, illegal. And um, I need to move the operations over to you immediately. And, uh, you know, change all passwords, change everything. Um, so it wasn't um, at any point that it jeopardized our customers because our customer data was secure. There was no breach. There was no, um, you know, uh, anything that would compromise um, the stability of our clientele or our business with our customers. It was more, I'm just going to steal all your ideas and go do the same thing. And all this time we're, we're stealing all your uh, visions and your company direction and all the things, the innovative things that you're going to do, we're going to steal those. And, and without you knowing, I'm going to go build it in the background and I'm going to go try to sell it. You know, that was kind of that kind of thing. It wasn't about taking our customers or because they never did that. They never touched, they never touched their customers. So, and that was a good thing because that would have been really dirty if it would have affected our, our, our customer base. And then that would have been like even worse. But uh, thankfully, um, it, what we were able to do, Tony, when I called you at that time, uh, you said, yeah, sure, Joe, no problem. And um, you, um, I mean, I remember um, that you assembled a team for us really quickly, really fast. I mean, it was like overnight. Um, you immediately put on a lot of resources uh, to help me out. And I tell you, Tony, back then, <clears throat> That was a, a, a mountain off my shoulders, off my back. You know, I mean, you took like, I, I mean, it was like, oh, thank God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what I have to say? I have to say it, was, it was really good timing, I think, too. I mean, never good timing, but I mean, you caught me at a, at a time when I could help. And of course, you know, who's not going to help? But um, yeah, I remember, I remember I was in disbelief and I thought initially, right, I'm always throwing shade offshore. And I, and I thought it was like, you know, uh, India or, or Eastern Europe, you know, I obviously I have nothing against those, those, those continents and those countries, but I immediately, I immediately assumed that I didn't know it was someone in your backyard that, that made it even worse in my opinion. But yeah, I was, so, I was so glad that we were able to, we had the resources at the time. We were able to jump in and and free Armor Link from that uh, situation. And hey, it, it worked out for us because you were a great client for uh, several years, right? I think you know, absolutely. Four or five years at least. Yes, I mean, you yeah. helped me a lot. You helped me a lot with a great team, great team of people. Um, you know, it was um, it was just a, a, a big relief. Um, you guys. Um, when I mean you guys, I mean your whole organization, everybody, you know, you had fantastic project managers and, and good people uh, willing to help. Um, you know, you were, um, 
you were always accessible to me. Uh, I felt like anytime I could pick up the phone and call you and you would talk to me. I remember you um, early on when we started, you were checking in with me and you were calling me from time to time. Hey, Joe, how you doing? How are things going? You know, how can we help you? Um, you know, is everything okay? So I knew that you had, uh, you were following up and you were interested in, in generally helping me. You really, you were, I mean, the, the I mean, I'll expand on, on our relationship a little bit because I think, I think that, you know, your customers should know this and the people that work with you should know this. And, and, um, I know you're a humble guy. You rarely, rarely are going to toot your own horn because you're very humble. But, uh, you know, um, I'll expand on a little bit uh, what happened in our relationship and how we grew with your with uh, your help. But at that time, when we made the transition, Tony, um, like I said, it allowed me to continue running the business. There was no interruptions to our customers. Uh, we were, you know, just like like if nothing ever happened. Uh, we were back on track in a matter of like 24 hours. Uh, everything was, you know, handed over. So you guys assumed the code, uh, assumed uh, you provided the engineering team that I needed, all the resources that I needed. And, uh, you know, we we had um, certain comfort that, you know, I felt like, okay, I, 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 I can trust. I can trust this man. I can trust this company. We have, you know, a solid working relationship. We worked for years like this back and forth together uh, on our project. You helped, you know, shape the product a lot, and, um, uh, helped us tremendously with, with everything we did. And, um, you know, um, obviously there was many, many things you did as a businessman to help me uh, in the business. Um, you did things for us that, um, not even family sometimes will do for somebody else. That's why sometimes I call you and go, what's going on, brother? And I say that mainly because, you know, I mean, you, you did many, many, many things that, uh, you know, you put a tremendous trust in me uh, in many areas from financial trust through uh, business trust to, you know, our relationship. And, and genuinely, you, you did that genuinely without any... Um, hesitation and you know and we're you know i i told my wife and everybody he says you know tony's been amazing with us um he's really been like family to us and um whatever compelled you for whatever reasons tony um you know even to this day we're very thankful and um it is you know a time in our business and in in the life of armor link where um having the support and, and uh, the genuine help from another businessman is made all the difference in the world for us to be able to move forward and continue our business. So for that, we're extremely thankful. And it, it just goes to say that the quality of person you are, the, the, how you run your business and, you know, the integrity of your business. Never once did we have any concerns or any doubt that we were in a bad place uh, working with your company. So we worked together for, for years uh, and uh, we transitioned then uh, to in-house. Uh, and when we transitioned to in-house was uh, uh, one of the reasons why, um, you know, we had to financially make sense for us uh, in the sense of what we were doing. Uh, you know, the company took a different direction. I needed to do some things that would be more practical in-house than using uh, uh, a team supplement situation or a hundred percent outsource. Uh, so we, we picked up the code uh, and then um, to this date, I have uh, developers in-house that we are developing ourselves. Now, this doesn't mean that, uh, simply PHPs out of the out of the question for us because I know that your team could augment my team. So if I call you tomorrow and says Tony, I need I need a couple of people from your team to work with my team um, to augment our development because we have a lot of projects to do. You know, I know you could provide those resources and uh, allow and help us with the development. So it's you know it's like 
you're still part of Armour Link. You're still part of us. We still have that relationship with with your company, and we have the flexibility to reach out to you, right? Um, and 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 trigger that anytime we feel that we need um, help from from simply PHP. We have roots with you. We we know who you are. We we have a very good relationship, and and um, you know that goes a long way uh, for us. So to the present, uh, you know, in development. Um, Yes, it was um, it, it was a very difficult time there, uh, an unexpected event in business, uh, very costly in attorney's fees, uh, a lot of time, you know, battling and, and uh, fighting for our intellectual property, uh, putting a stop to this, shutting down that company who for doing this to us, you know, and uh, eliminating everything. So fortunately, uh, you know, we um, uh, it was a, a federal lawsuit that we filed and um uh, you know, it was uh, settled, eventually settled, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we, um, it wasn't a fun, it wasn't a fun part to be able to, you know, but we had to, it, it was, it was a, it was one of those situations where you have no choice. You have to defend your intellectual property. You have to defend your business. You know, I wasn't about to let someone knock me off and copy everything I did and let them get away with it. I mean, that was just wrong. Yeah, I remember, Joe, I remember uh, we had a couple of our people uh, testify in the proceedings and, uh, you know, what a what a way to waste time and money, right? Like, you, you should be concentrating on growing your business. Instead, you're lawyers, you're doing uh, depositions. And uh, I remember they had the camera crew come to our office and uh, interview us. And uh, it just, but to, to go back on the, the impact that um, I personally had on Armor Link and the company, you know, Joe... Uh, it's all about you, though. We call you Uncle Joe, right? So when you have clients <laughs> like like you, and I definitely have a few more. <laughs> and I definitely have a few more. It's just a pleasure, right? It's like all you want to do is please people like you. So you know, uh, right back at you, Joe. We had we had a we had some uh, we had some interesting times. We had some good great laughs uh, with uh, with some with some really cool characters. And uh, yeah, I remember, I remember, you know, welcoming, welcoming when you said, I want to hire a couple in-house developers. I, I actually agreed with you. I said, you know what? I think at this part in, in your business, it may, it may be beneficial to have someone in your physical office that you can uh, throw a shoe at yeah, <laughs> or, or throw a phone yeah. at. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. You know, Sorry, and, and... No, no, it's true. It's true. I mean, that's, that's, I know what you're saying, you know, um, the metaphor. Yes, I get it. It's the, um, yeah. And I says, you know, business are dynamic, especially today. You know, you have to be able to be flexible. You have to be able to adapt, uh, overcome situations, um, change with the times. Uh, you know, like right now, I'll tell you something, Tony, we've done in the past year uh, for our business. We, uh, we have, uh, accomplished many things on the security. Uh, security has become a huge thing right now for companies. And I can imagine, uh, you know, the value that uh, like people like you, with, with you, like your company, what va uh, tremendous value you can bring to companies today, uh, which a lot of people overlook is uh, the security in our profession right now is huge. Uh, people are concerned about uh, foreign countries hacking uh, you know, the United States, uh, uh, I mean, just many things that are, that are really huge. Yes. Ransomware, everything. I mean, look what happened recently with the, um, other companies, uh, virus protectors and all that hackers, just many things. And, and whether it, it, it's an attack or, um, an internal, um, error that a, maybe a company made that affected customers or uh, I mean, just look at all the things that uh, we've seen in the newspapers and uh, events that happen every day. So the point I'm making is security is, is, is at the forefront of every business today, especially in law enforcement. Uh, and what we've done uh, in our company now, we uh, are right now, actually we're under audit right now, for our certification of uh, our SOC 2 type 2 uh, certification. And um, so the SOC 2 type 2 is for uh, the operational controls of security uh, in an organization. And uh, 
it's a tough uh, certification to acquire. Um, basically, you know, we're, we're right now in the middle of our audit. Uh, the auditors are checking our company with a microscope and every aspect of security and data and how everything is stored and how we proceed in our documentation. I mean, they're looking for things like our office log, who came into the office, who left the office, you know, um, every control that we have for security is being right now audited. Um, and uh, once we complete the audit, and then there's a report that shows any deficiencies in our security, or the good things and the bad things, and they give you a window to make those corrections or recommendations that they make, uh, the auditors make on our security infrastructure. Uh, next to that, we're lined up to do our ISO 27001 certification. And again, this is all for uh, security on uh, technology and operational controls. Uh, it's another level of, of um, security audit and certification that we are uh, marching toward. So we hope um, by next year, um, this year we'll complete our SOC 2 type 2 audit, and then next year we'll do our um, ISO audit, and uh, we'll have those certifications, which sets us apart from a lot of businesses in, that uh, don't have those certifications. Uh, for security. And then um, we also became uh, GSA vendors for the General Services Administration for the federal government. We got approved. We're under contract with them. So we achieved that uh, this year. So there, we've, um, like I said, uh, been growing in other areas of the business uh, and all to the benefit of our customers because nobody's, uh, so to speak, uh, forcing us to do this. But we know it's important, uh, especially to, to build the trust of our customers, that we are uh, certified by an independent party that says that our security is solid and that we have good operational controls and that we're doing everything legit. There is no, you know, there's no server in some building that has our customers' data. You know, we're running AWS GovCloud. You know, and the strict requirements that we have under GovCloud and government under, you know, um, U.S. soil, you know, only people in the U.S. can touch the data. You know, um, the, you know, there are certain requirements that we are meeting right now that um, that are very strict in, in our security and enable to do business in the United States uh, in our profession, which requires that um, CJS compliance, criminal justice information, you know, systems and all that all require uh, a very high level of security and standards that we have to follow. Just as the same way we have to follow uh, procedures for the General Service Administration and other certifications that we're doing. It's it's all about, you know, the, building that trust, building that security um, for our future customers. And another area, you know, that we maybe haven't touched upon that comes to mind is customer service. And while we have uh, a business and you may have, you know, like us, we can deliver a product, we make a product, uh, you know, a solution, we sell it to our customers, we support it, we train our customers, but what about customer service? That's huge. Customer service is huge. And um, people forget that. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I've sus I subscribe to other programs that we use for our business and, uh, you know, sometimes you call their service or their support and it's, you know, to a foreign country and half the people don't understand where you can't understand what they're saying. They can't understand you. You know, the, the, the customer service is just very bad, you know, and you're like, uh, you know. How does that make sense? It's, it's so crazy. I don't, I, don't, I don't see how that makes sense. You find some companies go out of their way to hide their phone number. So you're looking for how do I call this company because I'm having a problem and they intentionally hide the number. Um, but I'm glad that, you know, ArmorLink provides amazing customer service. And of course, I'm not surprised. Look at the leader. <laughs> no, I just think that it, I, I think, you know, I tell every customer of mine has my cell phone number, every customer. And I said, if you ever have a problem, you pick up that phone, you call me directly. Um, and we do have an 800 number that operates yeah, and we have an 800 number that operates 24 hours a day. We have an answering service. 
that's convenient for our customers. They have an emergency. They know they can call the 800 number. I mean, you know, maybe I'm busy or whatever. I can't answer my phone on the spot, but they know if they call the 800 number, somebody's always monitoring that. So we do have, we, we do make it easy for a customer to reach us and get control. We do respond, you know, to our customers, you know, in, in a reasonable window of time, the same day, you know, sometimes within 15 minutes, sometimes within an hour or so, but we are being responsive and that's so critical. And I know that in your business, Tony, you have the same philosophy. I, I knew from the first day you and I started working together and I knew that I could pick up the phone and call you and you would answer or you would text me back or you would say, can I call you later or something like that? You know, I know you were in a meeting or something. I says, yeah, sure. It's not urgent. But, you know, to have that relationship, you know, and that level of, of customer service, you know, it's priceless for and, and, and people miss that. They forget that sometimes when they sign up with a company, they become a number. They become an account number, you know, and uh, that is frustrating when you pick up the phone and you're trying to get support or something. And someone, what's your account number? Oh, what's this? And give me your password. And OK, and we verify who you are. Oh, well, that's not part of the support plan. Oh, you'll have to subscribe. I mean, and you just never get the help. And, you know, it's it's frustrating for a business. Anyway, go ahead. Were you going to say something, Tom? Well, I was just going to underline uh, what you said is I give. Obviously, everyone has all my clients have my cell number as well. And, you know. People tease me sometimes. They say, how do you give your clients your cell number? I said, I'm just happy to have clients. <laughs> I don't mind. I'm glad when a client reaches out and, you know, most of the time it's an issue that I can fix. And, you know, they send me a quick text and I'm walking my dog, whatever. It's all it's all happened, but it's all good. I'm just grateful to have uh, good clients, have a good business. I find a lot of people when their business starts succeeding, they say, oh, well, you know, I don't want anyone to bother me. You know, we're we're obviously the opposite. I'm so happy that uh, that Armor Link's doing great, Joe. And I I don't want to take too much more of your time. I'm just I'm just thrilled we finally get to do this podcast. And I know that I was supposed to fly in to visit you, and then COVID happened. Uh, but um, I'm I'm definitely I we we've, we've got to have that beer together. We we got to make a point, and it's going to happen one of these days. Absolutely. We are looking forward to that, Tony, for sure. You know, you're always welcome. And uh, it's been a great opportunity to, to chat with you. Uh, I'm glad that uh, your company's out there servicing people um, and keeping up the great job that you do with your team. Um, so dittos, I mean, wishing you the very best. And uh, certainly it was a pleasure speaking with you today. Um, do say hello to your team for me. Uh, warm, warm hello to everyone. Uh, certainly miss them, and uh, I hope uh, we talk soon or 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 have a beer together soon. <laughs> All right, Joe. Great. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk soon. All right, sir. Have a fantastic day. Thank you. All right. You too. Bye, Joe.